sun streaking cold, an old man wandering lonely. I pulled on my friend, don't you start away uneasy. For what's hard you see, it's only me. Hello there and welcome to my channel. My name is Doug and I'm back with another fountain pen review. Today I have a beautiful Visconti fountain pen on loan from my friend Ron. This is his Visconti Rembrandt. I've really appreciated having this pen for an extended period because it allowed me to compare his Visconti Rembrandt with my Visconti Van Gogh. My Van Gogh is the most expensive fountain pen I've ever purchased and is certainly beautiful, but I was a bit surprised by the comparison of these two Viscontis, and I'll explain it all to you when we look at these pens right now. This is my friend Ron's Visconti Rembrandt, generously on loan for review. Of course, I've had it since Christmas, so it's a rather long loan. I was anxious to see his Rembrandt after having purchased my own Visconti last year. His Visconti came in this lovely presentation box, the faux alligator or crocodile covering. Let me open it up, and we have the pen. I assume there was a bottle of ink in this depression right here. Of course, the Visconti logo, Forenza, art for art's sake. And we pull the pen out. Here is my Visconti. This is the Visconti Vachoch which is uh, the proper pronunciation of Van Gogh. From now on in this video, I'm going to pronounce Vachoch as Van Gogh, as I don't want to splash my pens. You'll pit your witch with me, little man, and you won't have your witch to pit with. Know what I mean? Sam, you're spitting on the nurse. Sorry, old lady. Crazy broad should be in bed. There are some interesting similarities and differences between these two Visconti models. So what I'd like to do is look at the parts and features of the Rembrandt, provide some size comparisons, some measurements, and do a writing sample. In addition, I'm going to include a segment on the great Flemish artist, Rembrandt van Rijn, for those of you who are interested. For those of you who aren't interested, there's always timestamps you can skip. And don't forget to stay tuned after the writing sample where I'll discuss what I like and what I don't like about this fountain pen. And Ronnie, you don't have to stay for that bit. Before we do the overview, here's a little segment on the Dutch artist and namesake of this pen, Rembrandt van Rijn. Rembrandt van Rijn was a Flemish artist of the Baroque period. He was a prolific artist, creating oil paintings, sketches, and etchings from the time he was 14 in 1620 until his death at the age of 63 in 1669. In looking at some of Rembrandt's works, you'd be forgiven if you thought he had nothing in common with fellow Dutch artist Vincent van Gogh, or Van Gogh, but you'd be wrong on a few counts. Of course, they are separated by 250 years and very different in styles, but they were born only 150 kilometers apart in the Netherlands, and young Vincent was hugely influenced in his early years by the great Dutch master Rembrandt. Vincent is quoted as saying of Rembrandt, quote, Rembrandt is so deeply mysterious that he says things for which there are no words in any language, unquote. Vincent visited the great Rembrandt painting The Jewish Bride at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and upon leaving, remarked to a friend, quote, Would you believe it? And honestly, I mean what I say. I should be happy to give ten years of my life if I could go on sitting here in front of this picture for a fortnight with only a crust of dry bread for food. Unquote. Rembrandt was a master of chiaroscuro, which is an Italian term that describes the effect of light and shade to reveal form in art. Rembrandt wasn't the first artist to use these techniques, and was heavily influenced by Italian masters like Caravaggio, an artist of the Italian Renaissance just 50 years before Rembrandt. And he wasn't alone. Me being a stage lighting designer for over 30 years, Caravaggio was where artists' interest in light began. Like Caravaggio, Rembrandt was fascinated by the play of light and shadow, and especially of the hidden light source. Many think Rembrandt's paintings were dark and somber. 
That's because hundreds of years of grime and dirt and yellowing multiple coats of varnish on his paintings has made them dark over time. Rembrandt's famous painting, The Night Watch, was so named because people of the 19th century thought the painting was so dark that it was a night scene. It is anything but, as can be seen in the restored canvas. Blazing sunlight glitters off the brocade of one of the officers of the watch. Coming from a career in theater, I truly appreciate Rembrandt's painting techniques, as they are similar to the work of professional scenic artists, who create enormous canvases that are made to be seen from a distance. The Night Watch is an enormous painting, standing about 15 foot tall. Rembrandt did not leave a diary or many notes or letters, but he is known to have admonished people from looking too closely at his canvases, as one would lose the magic of his techniques. Single strands of thick paint layered on, layer after layer, create the illusion of sparkling sunlight on silk and gold brocade. The effect is astonishing. I'll put some links in the description below to some fascinating articles on Rembrandt van Rijn. The Visconti Rembrandt is a current model and has been such for quite a while. Ron bought this Visconti more than 10 years ago, although the actual pen in my hands is not that same pen. There's a bit of a story behind this pen. This one probably dates between 7 and 10 years old. The reason is Ron had some issues with his original Rembrandt. First, the cap cracked, and it came back to him from Visconti with a new cap. Then the feed broke, and Visconti sent him a whole new pen. That was about three years after he had purchased the original Rembrandt. That's pretty amazing customer service from Visconti. The Visconti Rembrandt is part of the Master's Collection by Visconti, and available in multiple colors, from black and blue to dark green, pink, red, and white. The pen is made with bioplastic or vegetable resin, which is obtained from hemp plants and polished to a high gloss. Starting from the top, we see a finial with the unique Visconti My Pen system. The finial base is a magnet, which will hold either the Visconti logo cap, as in my Van Gogh, like that, or, as in Ronnie's pen, a custom initial set. You can also purchase various jewel finial tops to match your pen or your taste with six different colors. Tiger eye, amethyst, amber, lapis lazuli, pearl, or hematite. It's easy to remove and replace these magnetic finials as they stay in place very well. I'm not going to remove Ronnie's, but I will show you on my Visconti how easy it is to replace that finial and there's the magnet underneath the finial cap and then it's just this easy to replace back again Bing. Bada bing bada boom I'm done the magnet is fairly strong and these pieces stay in place fairly well under the finial you'll see the spring-loaded clip, the curve of which is an echo of the famous Ponte Vecchio bridge in Florence, Italy, where these pens are made. The hinge clip has the Visconti in negative enamel on both sides. This dates this pen as older because the Visconti is now changed to a laser engraving of that name Visconti on both sides of that clip. As you can see from some of the wear on this enamel, that was probably a good idea for longevity. The rounded finial moves to a straight cap and an intricately designed cap band. We need to look at this band very closely to appreciate its intricacy. We have a floral relief pattern that is reminiscent of Rembrandt's ornamentation and then Rembrandt in script now, I'm not sure this is not engraved. I believe it's some kind of an embossing, but it's a raised lettering. The lower part of the band has a concave chamfer and then a small step down to a very straight barrel that is straight all the way to the rounded end finial where there is a domed metal cap. This part is actually screwed into the barrel as I found it with about a half a millimeter gap right there. So I used an elastic band like this and gave it a, a bit of force and turned it, cranked it quite a bit down on my desk 
to get that little end finial cap seated back again. There's still a little bit of a gap there, but uh, that must have worked loose over time. The cap has a magnetic closure, which is secure enough to keep the cap from falling off and from spinning. However, you may find yourself absently using the cap as a fidget spinner, which is a lot of fun. I do this on my Van Gogh all the time. This model seems to have an orientation to it, however, as the Van Gogh does not, um, as sometimes it will require a slight turn to make it seat. So if I pull it out, you can see that it's sitting there, and I just give it a slight turn, and it clicks. Like that. Whereas the Van Gogh goes down any old orientation. This might have just been a refinement in the Visconti cap mechanism over the years. The cap comes off to display a metal section that has a small step towards the nib, which is almost a number six size steel nib, and there is the plastic feed. Let's take a closer look at this nib. This is one of the old style Visconti steel nibs, more about which I will discuss in a minute. This larger old style nib has a crescent breather hole, some really nice scroll work, and Visconti Firenza engraved on it. Of course, Firenza is Florence, Italy, where the pens are manufactured. This is a medium, as you can see from the M under that small crown frilly bit. While cleaning the pen, I disassembled it completely to show the parts and give it a thorough cleaning. I should note that the converter displayed is not a Visconti converter. This is a converter I found, a standard international converter I found that I put in the pen. This is the converter that came with Ronnie's Visconti. I'm going to close up on it here. I thought it wasn't a Visconti at first, but it does have the Visconti. It's a little bit worn, but it does say Visconti right here. But it has threading on it. And I discovered, while inking up the pen, that it doesn't actually seal inside the pen very well because I got ink all over the place. So it doesn't look like it fits this model for some reason. I don't know whether it came with the pen or he purchased it separately and purchased the wrong one. The converters do not come with the Rembrandt or the Van Gogh pens. Considering these pens retail between $150 and $240 U.S., Making the buyer shell out another $14 US for a Visconti converter, which is actually just a $5 standard international, is a bit much in my book. The pen does take standard international cartridges and will accept two standard international short cartridges piggybacked. The cap posts deeply and securely. I find I have to twist both the Rembrandt and the Van Gogh to make it seat a little bit more securely because it tends to rattle around a little bit. This does cause abrasions in the resin of the barrel. It is fairly easy to polish out such abrasions. Ronnie's Rembrandt here had been fairly well used over the years and sported a few scratches and abrasions. After obtaining his permission, I polished up the cap in the barrel of the pen with some Meguiar's Swirl Remover 2 and then some polishing with my jeweler's cloth. It has come up very, very nicely, very, very shiny. That is another point to note in contrast with the Van Gogh. The Rembrandt is polished to a high glaze where the Van Gogh is slightly duller and the cap and the barrel on the Van Gogh are faceted where the Rembrandt is smooth and round. The pen feels comfortable in the hand, either posted or unposted. The metal sections on both pens are identical and very slippery. Excuse me, I'm kind of in a hurry. And also fingerprint magnets. If you dislike metal sections at all, then these pens won't please you. They are fingerprint magnets and I can actually feel my grip slipping as I write for extended periods. My fingers do get a little bit sweaty when I'm writing. 
I don't think it would be more expensive to make a section that has the same resin material as the cap and the body, as they've done on the budget entry level Visconti Breeze. So when you're pricing a steel nibbed pen in this range, the metal section is disappointing in my opinion. So let's take a look at some size comparisons. So here is the Rembrandt next to Visconti Van Gogh, a Visconti Breeze, a Pen BBS 308, and a Wingsung 699. Now let's look at them posted. Here you can see the biggest difference between the Rembrandt and the Van Gogh is the, the number six and the number five size nibs. However, it should be noted that around 2008, Visconti changed out all of their steel nibs to this one. That means that old and new style Visconti steel nibs are not interchangeable. It used to be you could swap nibs among Rembrandt and Van Gogh. You can still swap old to old and new to new, but not new to old. My wife's Breeze unit is interchangeable with my Van Gogh, but not with the Rembrandt. Here you can see the section on the Breeze matches the body and the cap. And here is the number six size Pen BBS nib and the number six size on the Wingsung 699. As far as posting goes, the best of this lot is the 699 Wingsung. It posts very deeply and very securely. The 308 Pen BBS rattles a little bit. The, the Breeze is actually better than both the Rembrandt and the Van Gogh. Why they can't do this with these two pens is beyond me. And let's look at some measurements. And we're back with the writing sample for this first generation. Visconti. Rembrandt. And this is a medium steel nib. And the ink today is Hiroshizuku Take Sumi and here is the test card for the Takesumi it's a nice charcoal black to gray uh, still a little bit wet here Let's check the wetness on the pen. As you can see it's nicely wet. Can't write today. For line variation, this is no pressure at all. And that's a little bit of pressure. You might be able to see that this nib is flexing just a little wee bit. You don't get a lot of line variation, it's a steel nib, but I felt a lot stiffer steel nibs than this one. It's nothing I would say was flexy, but it's got a little bit of bounce to it, but it's, which is really nice. And the pen is very, very Smooth, dyslexic today, smooth. <laughs> Let's bring in my Van Gogh for a moment. This will highlight the difference. Uh, this pen, I don't know whether you can hear that or not. has a lot of tooth to it. 
it's almost like pencil on paper. Like a graphite pencil on paper. And that's actually very pleasant for some. The pen is very, very smooth. But this is what surprised me here, was this one, is there's almost no feedback. very glassy. So that's ostensibly the difference between the new steel nibs and the old steel nibs. I believe they had some issues with the old steel nibs in terms of quality. Uh, this one isn't one of them because that's beautiful. I didn't realize until this comparison how much feedback there was on my Van Gogh. So it's a fascinating comparison. Now let's listen to it right. Very, very pleasant writing experience. And as to reverse writing, it's scratching a bit on the upstrokes, but it's very wet. And as to some quick writing, That feed keeps up very, very nicely. So there you have it, the Visconti Rembrandt first generation. Now, what do I like and what do I not like about this fountain pen? I've been writing with Ronnie's pen for about a week now in preparation for this review. I have to say when I first got this pen and I compared it with my Van Gogh, I was thinking my Visconti was superior. But after writing with it, I'm sad to give it up after this. And my Van Gogh feels a little bit lacking in the competition. I love the larger size number six nib on the Rembrandt, not just for size, I'm a big fan of a larger nib, but because of its glassy smoothness and very wet line. At first glance, I wasn't impressed with the dark color of this resin, but now that I've polished it back to its previous luster, it is really gorgeous and very understated. I'm not sure it'll come across in the video quite so well, but there's very subtle striations of light purples and dark purples uh, and grays in this pen all over. And it's very beautiful. You can get Rembrandt's in some less subtle finishes, with some not even close to Rembrandt's color palette even. The pen is very well balanced, both posted and unposted. And the magnetic closure is very satisfying and very cool. Now, what do I not like about this pen? Ronnie, please mute your iPad at this point. I'm not listening! This is something I don't like about either Van Gogh or the Rembrandt. This metal section. It's very slippery and a fingerprint magnet, which is a bugaboo for those of us who are OCD about these things. Next, staying with the section, why isn't the section the same material as the cap and body? of this Visconti. Come on now, Visconti. You did it for the breeze. And that feels very nice. And the Van Gogh and the Rembrandt models have been around for years and are big sellers for you. I might even buy another Van Gogh if it has a resin section. As it is, I'm not using the most expensive pen in my collection because of the metal section. So come on, Visconti, get with the program already. <laughs> As if they're even listening to me. Another thing which is just a slight issue is that the clip isn't tight when it's clipped to a shirt pocket. I like the way the clip looks and how easy it is to grip just by pinching your fingers together like this, but it seems the spring is just not strong enough to keep the pen from slipping inside a pocket. But that's about it. This is a lovely writing instrument. It's on the high end for price, of course, in a steel nib. There's no doubt about that but it is certainly worthy of consideration. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe. 
And don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notification of new videos when they are posted. And that just leaves it for me to say, thank you for watching. And that's all she wrote.